So there's a lot of just intuition that goes into trying to pull the real scenarios out of people and seeing, okay, does this person really work well with this person or do we need to kind of address that? And if they are coming to us, it means that their existing space isn't working. So sometimes there's also a process of getting people to be more open and, and really and honest and looking at, well, this hasn't worked for you. You have a new opportunity. How do you want to shift it? What? How do you want to feel? What do you? What do you want people to feel when you walk through that door? And now let's put the steps into place to try and get you there. Welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Today we have Mel and Laura. Laura or Laura? Laura. La Laura. And I'm spacing on last names already. Zulamis. Zu Laura Zulamis and Mel no, Scammon. Scammon of Bowerbird Design. Mm -hmm. And you guys specialize in interior design <coughs> and mostly commercial we interior do. design. Yes. I looked through your website, saw a lot of work that uh, looked really nice. Um, and your studios are in Saco. Right. Do you yeah. both live in Saco or do you live in the Portland area? I live in Portland. Portland. That's all right. Mm -hmm. you know. I grew up in Saco. Does that count? There we go. Yes. Yeah, I know. The Bitterford <laughs> Saco area is happening. It is. So how are the two of you doing today? We're, we're doing great. How's business? Uh, we are super busy. Yeah. And um, really at a good place. You know, we're really starting to just, you know, get into sort of a comfort zone with our business being how long have you been in business yeah so three, three years for the two of us. three years three years yeah the rule yeah. of thumb is if you can stay in business <laughs> five years you'll you're, you'll survive but you feel that within three years you're starting to get into a groove and feel that definitely this we could are. this could continue. We're, we're could continue we're finding a good work life balance that's a hard so thing i i just spoke balance. with uh, angela adams and she had a an interesting point that she made where ahead of time she envisioned the life she wanted to live mm -hmm. and then planned her business around that yeah. as far as mm -hmm. using that as a touchstone to Definitely. come back to, mm -hmm. to every decision she made with her business. Is this going to deviate from, yes. um, you know, from that? So. Yeah, I think we've definitely been able to, I think that's why we started for ourselves. Really? So we kind of, we looked around and we just kind of said, we're not going to find that balance that we're looking for, mm -hmm. um, doing what we were doing previously um, with a previous firm. And then just kind of said, I think it's time we do it on our own. And we will so be able to find that. So what are your backgrounds balance. that uh, <coughs> made you capable of doing what you do and then brought right. you together? So, um, you know, uh, we were both educated in interior design. Mm -hmm. um, after graduating high school, I moved to Chicago and worked under um, a pretty amazing person. Um, the firm was a mid-size architecture interiors firm. Mm -hmm. And um, this person in particular worked for um, when he was younger at SOM. Oh, okay. And sort of in their heyday. Keep trying to get them as clients. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, was um, just really like inspirational to me, um, and you know just everything I learned about sort of Chicago design and architecture to the it's international and style, yeah. right, was really sort of so I went my to foundation. Just around the corner uh, in Berrien Springs, okay, from, from Chicago, and we'd take trips to Chicago. And yeah. It, Observe the architecture and everything yeah. else. It was really nice. So, what was it about that person that you gravitated to and was inspiring to you? Yeah, I mean, he he was just he like lived and breathed architecture and design. Mm. Like it was just like the passion was coming out of his pores. And so he would call me into his office, and I would sit as his you know student practically, right. a new a new designer, um, you know, fresh out of college, and I was like ready to soak it all in <laughs> and he was like she's the one that wants to hear it <laughs> right and um it was he just wanted to talk about it and mm. i wanted to listen and you know it was just um everything about what he talked about was just um the foundation of design some of the things that we learned about in college but you know, when you look at the foundation of, you know, the modernist or the international style and everything that was that, um, 
it really was something that I connected to. Mm. So um, it um, not only was something that he talked about, but it was what we practiced in right. all of our interiors. So Isn't that interesting when you find the people that are so inspirational in, mm -hmm. in, in forming what you gravitate towards? they just exude that first and foremost the passion for that right the you, you can kind of pick up on the people who seemingly are kind of like phoning it in oh yeah but the the people who really just like it's just coming out of it their just, pores or it's like oh wow it just, you're into this like and it means something to you and and it's really interesting to me to you can find that in any field mm -hmm. like oh here's these people that are all into like punctuation and they're like a writing technician <laughs> and then there's and the, it like life means more through that for them and you know I found that through a certain architectural professor in my first few years of architecture school same thing that's why I ask I, I think that's yeah. really interesting but that passion kind of it's the uh, it's the grease that keeps that thing yeah. going and, and also the spark that lights the next fire is, is really interesting. And at the same time when we were talking when I was there for four years he was writing a book Chicago Architecture mm. with um, you know another another gentleman and, and had um, Hedrick Blessing who was the photographer mm. at the time oh, there cool. in Chicago do all the photography and um, but this, it's a beautiful book and it has um, <clears throat> you know, uh, just all the history of, uh, of, of Chicago and, and, you know, it's, it's the first city to build a skyscraper, you know, and right. it's so interesting to think about, you know, what happened after the war, you know, when, um, you know, the Bauhaus was essentially closed and Mies came to, you know, to Chicago rather than Boston, you mm -hmm. know, and, you know, and then after that, like, you know, uh, there were tons of architects who saw what was happening and like they wanted to be there, too. And so I love the energy and the dynamics of things and how right. how it happens. Those, those amazing. minimalist <laughs> clean lines to me, they just <coughs> goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, the the his um, infamous apartment building on Lakeshore Drive. That and the, <laughs> he did the post office there yeah, too, there's, right? There's a, Love that building. there's a building there. There's a, lots of amazing things there. Yeah. So, so uh, how about um, how about you, Mel? It's all based on travel. I don't I don't know that it was one person that inspired me to really like seek the design, but I just had some opportunities quite young to be able to do some traveling and was kind of addicted to the sights and the sounds and the people and the architecture and hmm. and just going into the different buildings and places and um, then it just became okay I can work two jobs and do this okay I can work three jobs and do this and every little penny I had got put towards plane tickets so I could go explore the next city and see the new oh, buildings wow. and spaces and interesting so. what have been the most inspirational cities for you and why um, Probably Singapore would probably be one of them. Singapore, Singapore. is really cool. Um, I had the ability to go and work there for about three weeks, um, probably about 10 years ago. Yeah. And it was all by myself. And the city, I couldn't get over how safe it was, but they had these like monstrosities that seemed like they went on forever. And I don't know, it was just every time you looked out the window, there was a different building that seemed to be pushing boundaries, pushing limits. And yeah. And every time you'd go into spaces, it was one of the first places that I'd been to that had a lot of interaction, um, like digitally. So you'd go into oh. these malls and they'd have cameras and they'd have TV screens, like wrapping the place almost uh, like three walls. So they'd have it on the ceiling plus the wall. So it almost looked like you're walking under an aquarium or just different. Oh, it was wow. constantly changing and kind of messing with your perception of, well, this shouldn't be here <laughs> or should it? So it. I don't know, it kind of forced you to interact with, with art, which is kind of what mm. it was. So I, um, I lived in Australia for eight years, so I got to do commercial interior design all over a lot of different parts of Asia based, based in, in Australia. Australia. And, and yeah, so I was based in Melbourne, but I got to do things like in Sydney and Canberra and Perth. And Did you just um, say Melbourne like an Australian? Yes. Melbourne. There's only Melbourne. one way to say it. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so my husband's Australian, so it made it easy to stay there for a few oh. years. How's he dealing with the winters here? <laughs> Surprisingly learning. 
really. Yeah, because the snow is different. I wouldn't, you know, we've, I wouldn't let him take a snow holiday for the last 15 years. And so finally, I was like, someday you'll have to move back to America with me and you'll understand why I don't let you go skiing while we live in Australia. Right. Now but he the, knows. But <laughs> the one thing you always say about that is what he loves is the bright blue sunny skies yes. here in the winter oh yeah where in australia have, it's cold yeah. it's just it's, cold it's cold and dark and sort oh, of yeah, yeah, yeah it's so hard in melbourne it goes gray yeah. melbourne goes gray oh, and the city cool. is it goes gray I, d- I thought time. nowhere in australia went gray <laughs> melbourne goes gray yeah it really does and laura's absolutely right he likes the fact that even if it's cold as anything outside it's still bright yeah well that's the thing about maine is you'll have these crazy and it it almost did that today where you know we had like three or four days of just harsh you know nor'easter conditions and then you get those northwest winds and like last night i got up in the middle of the night and looked out and it was just (laughs) stars and i thought today would be blazing blue like it is but it's kind of off and on but Mm -hmm. usually that next day you get that just clear out and it's all white a blue sky and it's just yeah. psh, just so bright it's gorgeous yeah I, I love that so the the uh singapore where where did you ever travel like tokyo or any anywhere no. else like that no so when i was younger um i'd gone to italy and that kind of i decided i was like i will base my decision on which interior design school i go to based on the fact that whoever will let me go back to italy <laughs> so i ended <laughs> up at endicott same as as laura and um yeah, I got to go six months and travel all over Italy, and then that led to running around a few other places, and that's I ended up meeting people and brought me to Australia, and yeah, but I haven't done too much of Asia. Mm-hmm. Like I was based out of Melbourne, doing projects in yeah, Asia, right. but wasn't on the ground. Yeah. The only place I got to go was Singapore, and that was amazing. Yeah, yeah. the uh, in in architecture school we spent a summer in Italy. That was just yeah rome was just amazing and then for our anniversary or two ago my wife and i had both been there separately before we were married so we went back together and just walked every day that was so nice just yeah to be in a a city like that that's actually still a working city while being so beautiful and everything else it's just yeah my husband and i laughed we didn't find out until a couple years later after we'd started seeing each other and we're going through things we both found plane tickets and different stubs and bits and pieces. So when I was in college, um, I did a spring break um, in Spain and I was running around Barcelona, um, looking at all the Antonio Gaudi buildings and Uh just completely immersed in that. And my husband from Australia actually happened to be there at the exact same time. So we looked at our plane tickets and looked at our stubs. So we were both touring the the same buildings at the exact same time. (laughs) But then met, yeah, several (laughs) years later. So it was kind of funny. So we haven't gone back yet, but we gotta go back together and try those buildings again. Yeah, do it. Um, So the two of you met in Chicago. No, No. so I was in a firm when I moved from Chicago, I moved back to Portland. Mm -hmm. And And you grew up in Portland? I grew up in New York. New York, oh that's right, okay. And my family moved up to, to Maine when I was um, 12. Okay. And, um, but um, when I moved back from Chicago, I moved back to Portland and started with a firm that didn't have a design department. So I grew that for about 20 years I was at that firm. Mm-hmm. And while I was there, Mel mm-hmm. um, brought her in as an intern. Yeah. So we started with that relationship. Okay. And I think I was on maternity, going yes. on maternity leave at the time. And um, she helped out quite a bit during that time and then hired her on full time for a couple of years. And then that's when she got her visa to go to Australia. But we kept in touch um, over the years that she was there. And um, and the firm that I was with, um, you know, uh, when she came back um, was that the younger designer who was there was going on maternity leave herself. So Mel was able to get her her foot back into the door there. Um, And then that firm actually um, closed. And about a year before it closed, we sort of, we've changed our, um, the structure of how we do business in terms of with them. Mm -hmm. Um, Because they were focused on financial institutions, we were able to start bringing in sort of everything else. And- All the commercial. All the commercial, everything. Offices. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, there wasn't sort of this, you know, I don't think it's ever been sort of heard of before where a designer can actually separate 
and work within that firm. Right. So you kind you of know, created a separate of, entity, kind of under the umbrella of that mm -hmm. original firm. We did. And then the original firm eventually is like they retired. Mm. And yeah, you guys were like, did. hey, we're still here. So we're still here. And a couple of folks from that firm did continue to um, start their own firm. And we, we um, work together on a lot of projects. We work, yeah, we yep. do. It's yep. a very good partnership with them. There's good synergy. Mm. And because we have all that background with them, um, it was just the seamless transition for all of our clients. And, you know, I mean, that said, they're, they're a small architect from their salesperson and an architect an architect. Mm -hmm. However, we work with a lot of other architects who um, don't have interiors, mm -hmm. so we team up with them. Oh, okay. Yeah. So an interesting thing for me to always hear about when I, when I interact with people like Kaplan and Thompson and mm -hmm. yourselves is the, the dynamic of partnerships. Because I've been in multiple failed partnerships, and the common denominator, unfortunately, there is me. <laughs> so I... Um, I learned a lot from each partnership fail, and I know they can be extremely difficult. So if it's not getting too personal, um, <laughs> like what is what has been the value and the difficulty in doing a business as a partnership? Oh, I, I it, it's just working. Yeah, really well for us. We just I think we knew we, each other so well yeah. beforehand, good, bad, and ugly. We knew mm. each other's strengths and each other's faults, and we're kind of like, okay. I so you're kind comes, of just already <laughs> naturally working as a partnership to begin it, with? It, yes, yes. Okay. But I think what it comes down to is that we both want to live really healthy and balanced lives, mm -hmm. and so and respectful lives to each other and to everything right. around us. And we bring how we live to the office, to the partnership. It's completely um, embedded. And yeah. so it's it's not like this crazy sort of personal life mm -hmm. and then we come right. into the office and we're just partners. We're we're friends as well and we hmm. you know, we we um we, it it's just sort of this natural we, thing that, that right. works really well for us. We know each other's quirks and we know how to deal with each other. <laughs> That's, like that's really <laughs> nice. Like I, I started uh, Caleb Johnson Architects. It used to be Johnson and Bell Architects, okay. and you know Caleb and I have been friends since uh, like our probably tenth grade year of high school. You know, okay. um, but Caleb was, is much more uh, regimented in how he works. Where I'm like, I'm coming in at eleven today because I want to go surfing this morning, and then I'm yeah. going to work late and. At the time, that kind of just blew his mind. Like, you can't do that in the professional world, you know. Right. And, and we just eventually just wanted to kill each other after a while. And, you know, we were like, all right, probably better if we're just friends. You know? I think yeah. we have flex. Like, we were very good at the beginning of the week going, okay, like, here's a list. These are the things we need to get done. So it's like as long as they get done by the time that they need to get done. Right. You know what I mean? There's, there's right. that little bit of flex. But... You know, we both have somewhat young families and our kids are at different stages in their lives and have different needs. Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore it's like some days, you know, I might need a little bit more time to get things done or sometimes Laura might need a little bit more. Like there's just right. always that flex and the other one is usually with their hand up going, well, you know what, well, let me try and work on this and then I'll work on that. And we, there's a lot of back and forth with us. Like we, right. don't, we don't just each take our own project and run with it. It's always uh, like our desks face each other. If that, I guess, is a good indication so you're of like how Dwight we work. So like Dwight and Jim on the office. Kind of <laughs> well, thing. it's there's, we just there's space. It's not like we're yeah. we're not there. There's the like, whole couch. It's like twenty <laughs> feet between us. But just the angle. That's so without a striking distance. Yeah, no, no striking. <laughs> but but what I mean is just in general, you know, they are facing. So there's a lot of conversation that kind of gets shouted mm -hmm. back and forth across to each other. Yeah. And we're moving around quite constantly. A bit. <laughs> you know, we're not. Yeah, we're just, and we. We all, we both focus on, on different, um, we have strengths. We, we each yeah. have our own strengths as well. So we just sort of naturally fall into those. And what are your individual strengths within that partnership? So I just have more experience with mm -hmm. financial institutions mm -hmm. and sort of millwork details and um, more like project management, that kind of thing. And Mel has more... Um, I mean, she okay. has a little bit more sales. Like she has um, some uh, history in in sales. She has definitely more um, 
the hands on graphics art, graphic and arts and things mm. like that. Okay. So a little, I'll usually uh, run with that part of a project. I mean, we always collaborate back and forth, but like I wanted to be a painter first and foremost. My parents mm. were like, you're going to be a starving artist. You can't be a painter. Pick something it's always else. Interesting and I was like, when you tell hmm. parents, like, no, I'm going to make a living as a creative. I'm going to go be a painter. No, no. Do it. Get so, a dependable yeah. job. So I always get really excited when we're able to, you know, talk to our clients about certain pieces. You know, it's kind of mm -hmm. like the icing on the cake. And yep. what can we bring in? It's like, you know, it's, and we'll talk to you about that, like, the whole holistic nature of the space and mm -hmm. you can't have this beautiful space and then you have nothing to look at on the walls that, right. that's that missing piece it's a, it's a broken link and so a lot of times i run a little bit with that and then laura you know we go back and forth until it's polished yeah we do have someone that works for us as well who does a lot of drafting yeah yep. so um which allows us three days that kind other of thing. things that's nice that yeah which i, I have no interest in doing three yeah. days <laughs> I, I like working with her to kind of give direction and things like that and, and build and design the space, but I'm, I don't actually want to sit and do that. Right. I feel like my... How have you found to... that working with uh, clients, actually showing them a 3D yeah. space? Do you keep like a model monochromatic so they don't get hung up on things no. at certain stages? Or? Uh, initially. Initially. Sometimes. Yeah. But then we're always working towards filling it in, filling it in. You're right. Yeah. So always. getting... Yep. Yeah. If they have trouble visualizing just space in general, yeah. then it's it's a it's a it's a double you know it's it's a it's a thing where clients expect the world of three day three Ds, mm -hmm. yet you don't actually get it. You right. know, it's right. it's, it's a tool. Space. Yeah, it's a tool to identify space and have a feeling of what it is, but it doesn't. It's not reality, mm -hmm. and it's hard for people to realize that. You really have to talk them through it. Mm. Yeah, we yeah. have to be very careful from the beginning. We say to them, like, yes, we can give you a three D, but dot dot dot. Like, yeah. please be mindful that it is going to skew the space a little bit. So if we we always try and walk them through the model, mm -hmm. like we get them into our office and then we'll hook it up, you know, on the big screen, and then we'll actually pan them through and walk them through so they get a better sense of the space. But if we just take stills you know and have those rendered and send it to them a lot of times it can make the space a little bit it, it's just not it's not quite true to life and yeah i think yeah. sometimes that can change then their perception so we're just we're mindful throughout the process with the three days yeah. but they've been beneficial overall definitely. i think it's definitely helped the process mm -hmm. yeah it was funny when i was going through architecture school i remember a friend of mine saying uh yeah, if I have to use a computer, I'm just not going to work as an architect. <laughs> I was like, mm, yeah, we'll see how long that lasts. See how long the electric racer lasts. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, you know, the, the, it was, initially it was that thing where it's like, all right, here's the space. And yeah. it's like, why is it all gray? It's, it's not <laughs> going to be all gray. It's just the form, you know, because when you use like yeah. a foam core model, people get it, you know, because yeah. it's like, oh, this is foam core, and I'm looking at a representation right. of the space, but when they look at a 3D anything else, they kind of think that everything there is literal or whatever. Right, and that's right. Whatever. But, right. But it's a good tool. It's just it's something that I think in the past year especially it's just become integral. It's just something that we usually, it's a service we offer, yeah. and a lot of times it helps us, you know, when we're trying to figure out certain elements um, of a space. It's I mean, we can visualize it to an extent, but sometimes it is really helpful to already it's have that tool. model it's built. Us, and it's like, sure. okay, yeah. pop that in. Yeah, when, when we were designing our house, I, I would build, what's SketchUp? I'd just mm -hmm. build, yeah. I'd yeah. kind of draw it out, and then I'd That's build just use. to yeah. mass the interior yeah. of the living room, living room, dining room, kitchen, just, yeah. you know, and get that idea. And it helped a ton. Um, we, we use Photoshop a ton, too. Yeah. We're, we're always importing bits and pieces and we'll even take, you know, um, parts of the rendering and we can Photoshop bits and pieces in and kind of give them a good sense of what space can feel like. So to get philosophically uh, oriented on this, what is the what is the basis for the decisions that you guys make in design? Is, is there a, a true touchstone to a degree that you come back to? <clears throat> It, I think hinges back to we always use the word holistic mm -hmm. and kind of like a wellness it's always that pursuit of wellness and creating spaces where people can be the you know the, the best 
in that space. So it's how they feel, how they move, how they interact with others, how um, even just you know, breathing easier, you know, having that stress come down, having your heart rate come down, you know, how do you create spaces that allow people to live their best lives? So when you're designing a workspace where stress is intrinsically present, Mm -hmm. (laughs) how do you, how how does the rubber meet the road in that uh, approach for you? Like what, what is it that you can put into a, a workspace that helps alleviate some some amount of stress in that way there's so many things that yeah. you can do so many things i mean it, it it's it's not just one thing it's but how they i work. think yeah i think the function first is how people work mm-hmm. the it's not just a list of what you need it's how can we help to support the way you work how can we make your lives better how can we make a difference for you and what is your relationship to everything around you, you Mm. know, and how can we um, hit the nail on the head with that? You know, how can we um, make a difference in your life? Um, Whether it's, you know, your desk, that's an ergonomic desk. Is it, you know, um, a green wall? Is it water elements? Are there, you know, wood, um, are there wood elements in there? Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Are there places that you can go to do the task at hand that are, that are not just at your desk? you know, we just really dive deep into just how people work, and then we find solutions and space plan so that we can create those opportunities for people to um, to use. And um, every every office, you know, there there are so many, you know, open office, open office. Like that's the theory. Like that's the best way to be. Like Google mm-hmm. or what have you. And that was my next question. You know, like it's where you that's stand on that. not how. That's not reality. And the fact is that every office, every um, uh, business is different. And, you know, can you find elements of that? Can you find out who they are and bring in sort of this unique space that best supports them? You know, finding elements so that they can still have spaces to... um, you know, lounge in or undedicated spaces that people can go to. But maybe the fact is that they don't even have laptops. Maybe they don't need that, you know. And so maybe they need a high, you know, security environment, you know. So there's just so many Mm -hmm. different needs that you really need to listen and not just, oh, we got to, everything's got to be open. Mm -hmm. So, like, you can't, you can't operate under the assumption that you know what is good for them because of what you just learned you know, wherever you just read it or what class you went to or what's sort right. of out there. Um, you really need to listen to who they are. And of course, you can give them ideas, but um, it's, it comes down to finding what is um, who they are and how you can best support them. So you're, you're, you're kind of sitting there with a the client going through where are the pinch points currently in your working process they're mm-hmm. creating Definitely. difficulty from your existing how can space. we make that better and how do you work and how can we alleviate that yes. and facilitate how your company works through the space that they yeah need and you're it. talking about adjacencies you know you're talking about um, especially if a, a company is moving to a new space and not designing them in so tight that they can't grow they in grow. two years grow and change. so mm-hmm. there's always that um, factor to discuss when space planning it's like it might look like a lot of space but you're gonna you know, you're it. gonna grow yeah. you're gonna want to move things around you're gonna i mean just you're gonna change. less than a year ago our wall was right there so it's yeah. it's li- it's living you know it's a yeah. living thing and so you're gonna try to you know hit that mark um but know that in probably 10 months they're gonna call you and there there's going to be something that they want to fine tune or change right. or grow or whatever so it's it's a living thing it's a lot of listening we do a lot more listening in the beginning than we do any sort of talking or advice or anything like that it's it's 90 percent and a lot of it you know we talk a little bit sometimes about intuition when we do certain things it's Mm. paying attention to people's body language paying attention to how they interact with each other even these small focus groups that get put in front of us you know Mm. for us to kind of interview and ask questions to it's how are they reacting to certain things? You know, is someone kind of keeping something to themselves because they might not want to say it, but what they're are boss sitting next to them. Right. What are you? Right. So there's a lot right. of just 
intuition that That's goes into trying yeah. to pull the real scenarios out of people and seeing, okay, does this person really work well with this person or do we need to kind of address that? Hmm. And if they are coming to us, it means that their existing space isn't working. So sometimes there's also a process of getting people to be more open and, and really and honest and looking at, well, this hasn't worked for you. You have a new opportunity. How do you want to shift it? What, how do you want to feel? What do, right. you, what do you want people to feel when you walk through that door? And now let's put the steps into place to try and get you there. And I think a space is the most effective when there is connection to the brand for employees. Right. So it's if just they one can, more layer of reinforcing. Yeah, if they can feel connection in their space, mm -hmm. if they can feel valued, if they can feel like they have places to go, if they feel like they've been heard, you know, if they feel like they have access to natural elements, mm -hmm. light, um, if they have ergonomic desks, like we talked about before, mm -hmm. a special chair for them. Um, you know, someone might have PSTD and, you know, that communication goes through HR and is, you know, shared with us. And how can we, you know, sensitively provide those things for people without sort of, you know, ostracizing them or right, keeping, right. you know, like uh, bringing attention to them, unwanted attention, um, but supporting them because everybody has, um, needs that equal opportunity to thrive, mm -hmm. you know, and feel good about where they are. We, you know, we spend so much time at work, then we it's need like to- 30% of yeah, our lives are spent at work. Well, that's then really it's up to us to provide, um, you know, those opportunities for them. And when we hear, when we go back, you know, to and we get to meet people at the end, after and they say, you know what, like months. my life right. has changed, and that makes a huge yeah. difference for us. Because if we can't do that, then we're not sure why we're doing this. You know, right. like we want to make a difference in people's lives. It was it's interesting to me when I first started shooting architecture. I was primarily interested in high end homes because there was more of a a budget for very unique one-off, uh, yeah. you know, and, and very, you know, really a lot of really uh, unique furniture. Everything was like one-off unique to yep. it, you know. And I was like, this is where it's at. This is the most. Mm -hmm. And then I realized as we started shooting more commercial spaces that the homes, while they're beautiful and nice and everything, the effect on people's lives yeah. is is you spend so much more time at work. Mm -hmm. These spaces that we started photographing that were commercial spaces, I started realizing those people are just going home at night and spending a little bit of time at home Martin and coming TV. back here. And this is where they <laughs> yeah. spend the majority yeah. of their life. And you start to realize how important the design mm -hmm. of the workspace really is when you see that the mass majority of people spend so much time actually in an office not at their home mm. right and that that to me started to really uh allow me to give a lot more uh credibility or whatever towards interacting with and shooting workspaces i've i've always retreated from office spaces or anything else because i have personality quirk where i just can't do uh the same thing in like if I had to do a shoot for more than like a few days, I'd start to get <laughs> weird. I just, I need change to yeah. a very high degree. Um, you know, so designing these spaces for people who go here repetitively and spend so much time there, it just seems so important. That's so much important. time spent there. Um, what, what, are you, what are your guys' thoughts on hoteling? We've, we've shot a few places that mm -hmm. it, I love it because you come in and all the desks are clean. Yeah, IDEX does that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, really? my sister works at IDEX, and you know she works in a specific department, but none of the desks are mm -hmm. anybody's. Right. And so non-dedicated, and sort of she'll come in and you know decide maybe it's this one today. Yeah. Um, but I've asked her like, okay, if you work in a department, do people tend to go to the same desks? Do people want that and people are creatures you know, of she said it's habit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the people do do that, but um 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, um, I think it all goes back to the organization so, again. So mm. it happens more with sort of larger corporations where you have non-dedicated deaths like IDEX. Yeah. Um, we, we did um, a, a huge expansion for Tyler Technologies in, in Cumberland a couple of years ago. And what we provided and what we worked with them on is um, a benching um, style desk for those who mm-hmm. are they visiting get up or, you know, or who are in sales yeah. and things like that. So um, there was a little bit of that, but, you know, for them, it just wasn't their model. We um, just haven't had clients that have, it, it hasn't fit them. Yeah. Not to say so, that it won't in the future, but at the moment, you know, everything we do is based on, well, what's the fit? It, and it hasn't been a good fit for our clients right yeah. now. I, I, I genuinely wonder how good of an idea hoteling is. When, when I look at it, from my perspective, it's great because it, the office stays so much less cluttered and clean, and, and clean yeah. from my perspective. And if I were in that environment, it would make, it would give me that opportunity for constant change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's but nice. I honestly, I don't think, I don't think a society would function well if there were a lot of me. Um, and I think, in general, people are going to want that consistency of knowing they have their space. And I yeah. wonder if that erodes on people yeah. that have to do a, a repetitive job. That to mm-hmm. not have that comfort of the same space takes something away from it. I, I, I genuinely wonder how that. That idea in interior design actually pans out. I think what what are your tasks too? Because like as an interior designer, if I had if I was in this giant firm and I had a non dedicated space, I think I would have a hard time getting creative because I Mm. I like to take my shoes off and I like to just sit and get cozy and I want to have my inspiration around me and I want to have you know cool artwork and I I want to change that up. It depends how you work. Yeah. If your work is your laptop. Then, then you're on the go. road and you need to stop in and have a two hour meeting, that's perfect for you. Right. But for us, we've it wouldn't got, work. <laughs> right, we've right. got stuff. Right. We need to figure out where to put it. And it's, <laughs> you know, our desks are just working environments with papers and materials. And that's why we have a really things, big library. You we know. can close the door. Um, right. But yeah, it, do, it comes down to what it's, how do you work? Um, and that's why I think in the couple of spaces that we've designed, they provide a little bit of that for those people who are visiting. Right. Um, and it's a benching thing where you could sit side by side and get on your laptop and work for a couple of hours. Yeah, we shot, it. we shot a place in Boston, like the entire thing was hoteling. Yeah. And I was like... And so was, was it empty? Thing. Was was the, yeah. the office empty? People were there? Yeah, filled. Yeah. What it was kind on of? a Sunday or whatever. Yeah. It was a, um, they were kind of like a uh, head, uh, what do they call it, headhunter? Yeah. They placed uh, high-end creatives for campaigns. Okay. Firm. Yep. So there's yeah. kind of like free agents Adjusting, yeah. that like, all right, Volkswagen needs this person to come in and work on their already established campaign, but they're going to adjust it a bit or I, I don't entirely understand. I don't know. There have been a couple of models, you know, in the past when people were looking at Google and saying, you know, um, let's just go all out and open. And actually, you don't even need to work here. You can work from home. And so half the office was working from home right. and they found that there was com- camaraderie missing. They found mm. that there was sort of the sense of the soul was missing in the it's company. Lost. And they started to bring, companies started to bring people back into the office. Um, you need to have those chance meetings, those yeah. chance encounters. Yeah. So even if yeah. someone's not from your department, you know, the best thing. And to we, connect. Yeah. People want to connect. You find people in the halls they, and at the water cooler. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the idea of chance encounters and the things that happen in the space where there's nothing else going on. Like I noticed when my wife and I started having, you know, smartphones where mm-hmm. you could constantly be entertained rather than just a cell phone. The, the, the moments when we'd be driving when you would naturally let your mind wander and process and then you'd talk, those were gone, you know, and that was... I started noticing that, and that was difficult for me. And I'm I'm chief 
I am chief sinner in that as well. I mean, I'll, I'll you know ask my wife to drive so I can just sit on Instagram and you know and I. They, they say the car was the most disruptive thing to human society so far because mm. it, it took town centers like mm -hmm. at, at the deepest level mm. and then um, television, you know. Uh, but now I think phones have gone to an insidious level in that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Interesting what you're Definitely. saying there. Um, as interior designers, how do you approach uh, your own space? Because it's going to be uh, one, you know, extremely personal, but then you're going to have clients, I'd imagine, coming to your space and judging you on that as well. How, how yeah, I mean, interesting was that? The number one thing for us was light. Yep. Yeah. That was Large the number windows. one. Yeah, that yeah. was the high number ceilings. one criteria was we needed to have light and we wanted high ceilings. And yeah. we, here, here. we looked at a few places. We, we looked a few places um, in Portland when we were moving because we were in Falmouth to begin with. Okay. Um, we looked in Westbrook and then we came down to Saco. Nice. And like I said, Businesses I grew, are moving mm, away yeah. from Portland well, to I, the Saco mm -hmm. Bitterford yeah. area. I grew up around the corner, so for me, it nice. didn't feel that far. Yeah. And um, so we looked at the mail, just chance, and kind of were open-minded, but I don't think we were, like, expecting too much. And yep. I think at that, we kind of looked at each other and went, bingo. Right. Like, we, right. you know, it. Yeah, as soon as we were in there and saw the light coming in and the floor was all lit up, it was like, okay, I this is our here. space. I can work here. This yeah. is our space. Yeah. And we looked at several spaces in Portland, like Mel yeah. said, that were, like, totally. There's no way. Like, <laughs> what? I can't yeah. work here. Oh. <laughs> and like eight foot ceilings, and they're like, oh, that, that's $30 a square foot. It was and very institutional, plus. and where with this, yeah, it was great. It, 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 it was a no-brainer, really. We picked out our we windows. Yeah. We walked in. They didn't have any walls up yet. They were just starting to stud out spaces, and there was one yep. other person way at the end of our, which is now our hallway, um, that was studying up there their walls and just said what do you want and we're like well we'll take from this bay to this bay and we'll provide you with plants <laughs> and we actually right, expanded right. after <laughs> six months six or months. a year we went to the next space and that's where our library is and it right. made room for um, two desks for intern and for yep. our employee so you yeah. you matched the pattern of your own clients as well we did right? you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. we did months, and we can go the other way too well, it was yeah. funny, <laughs> as need. soon as we, we would have i think I think we would have been tempted to take that original space as well, but they were using it as like a show space in the very yep. beginning. Yep. It was kind of, you know, the one finished space they were going to take people to. Model. Um, yeah, like a model. And then, and then they quickly brought somebody in there, and it wasn't, it wasn't a good fit for their particular business. And, you know, so they bought a brand new home, and they could run their business out of their home much easier than carting back and forth right. to the mill. And so he just came in, and knocked on our door, and goes, I'm about to give my notice. Do you guys want my space? And we're like, yeah, we ran up the stairs. We're like, okay, <laughs> yep. done. Yeah. done. It's and ours. this is the mill right across from the Amtrak. It is. Yeah. The one right there. Yeah, yeah. It is. I remember yeah. I've been here since 2003, and that thing was oh, just wow. sitting vacant for, mm. I just kept thinking, when are they going to do yeah. this? And then it, was, mm. it felt like one week it was done. Mm. You know, it they just came in and did the whole thing and it was vacant like my whole well. childhood mm -hmm. it was yeah, like right? you know they say broken window syndrome yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know it was just you didn't you didn't go down there for the longest time they had windows on that one face towards the street and that was it mm -hmm. and i was like oh they put 10 they windows put <laughs> it's kind of fun about it is that mel's grandfather when it was a tannery worked there, worked as there. A, right? as a yeah and that yeah. Was a man yeah yeah it's pretty it's cool I, I hear a lot of stories like that around here and mm -hmm. a lot of the people that doug has still kind of as maintenance people and, and working the mill were had Family been there members. in the past yeah. generation of the mill and everything when do you think the actual other side of Saco island is going to get developed do you have your finger yeah. on that oh, at all it's happening yeah. really I so like with happening. the marina and everything well um, well i think that was put on hold mm -hmm. over the past year yeah. um i don't know what has to happen legally for that but um but i think just in, in general i think yeah. just in general yeah. it's like i think the pull of bitterford and yeah. what's happening in bitterford so quickly is kind of Sacco's now kind of playing catch up and i've seen it just even on like a social media oh, yeah. uh front you know every time a new business comes into Sacco, they've done a really good job of you know doing posts and they interview the new people that are coming in and really try and get the community together and yeah. so and that's something that i feel they've really strengthened in the last few years so yeah. what i mean it's it's happening now i feel like it, it's a slow 
it's a slow push in that in that direction. Well, it's always been interesting to me because Saco has kind of the uh, management infrastructure that the management from the mills would have lived in Saco a little yes. more so, where all the workers would have lived in Bitterford, yes. but Bitterford had the big downtown, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of that interesting, you know, Saco feels much smaller on its Main Street yes. scale, where Bitterford, long, nice Main Street, but Bitterford has been discovered now, and it is, it is quickly yeah. changing. Mm -hmm. it, it was the Battle of the course, Bridge. Definitely. Well, it, was it, was the ba the it was the Battle of the Bridge when they were, <laughs> no, I've been saying, but back, way back when, oh, yeah, they used yeah. to have the Battle between of the Bridge, Saco, between yeah. Yeah, Bitterford and Saco, so oh, before right. it was a football game, it was right. literally like a little this fight you know it was, it was a battle on the bridge they oh, took wow. it out but it's because you did you had all the the sea captains houses with all the widow walks and things all yeah. up main street and the mill owners were all up main street and yep. like you said all the immigrants and all the workers and the people that were actually doing the labor were multi-family all down on Bitterford. Bitterford, yep. yeah. yeah you got it it's an awesome little town i'm i'm glad i, I just talked to another guy actually who moved here from ventura because they're just getting huh. totally priced out of mm. California yep. and crowded. And it was funny because I was talking to him and we have a few acres of land just in the southern part of Bitterford here. And it's like, yeah, and we have a little tractor. And he's like, you don't have a tractor in California unless you're a multimillionaire. Because wow. you just don't get enough land and only like wealthy ranch owners. And tractors like a luxury <laughs> thing, at Cal you know. And here it's like, yeah, you got a little snowblower on my tractor and I do the thing, you know. You wouldn't think twice about it, but mm -hmm. yeah. Funny. So We're lucky here. Yeah, yeah. It. I think it's a great place to live, especially if you can just get out for a little bit during the winter. We're good. Yeah, it's a mindset. Yeah. Um, so to round this conversation out, talk to me about the the choice of name for your company, Bowerbird, because mm. <laughs> my kids watch nature shows, yes. and I I have gleaned some information. Do they on watch Dave, David, David Attenborough? Attenborough? He's my well. superhero. <laughs> Occasionally, but... Um, He's the one that talks about the Bowerbird. Yes. Yeah, there was... Where did I see another one? Or in that? But I, I thought it was so interesting. Those, those little guys, they'll go and steal the yeah, other... Yeah, they will. They do. We don't do that. We don't steal, but they yeah, work very hard. We don't up, steal but. other people's <laughs> things no, to but they're, make ourselves look better. Right. No. <laughs> it, was, it, was more about, it was more about their little work ethic. Like yeah, they yeah, are insane. hard little workers, and just they are creative. Just beautiful little things, little too. Little architecture. Some are little, and then some can little be poles six feet. That come up. Yeah, Amazing. some can be some sprawl, six eight feet, and they have you know like the little six to eight, six on eight the feet. Forest they floor, do yeah. Yeah. all woven, intricate. Yeah, with little tent poles in the middle. <laughs> right. Yeah, and yeah, that's right. Don't they make they like do. a little they single? They do. There's different. Yeah. There's different types. There's different, few, types, there's different yeah. types of bowerbirds. Yeah. So mm. being in Australia for eight years, a bowerbird is. Are they Australian? They're Australian. They yeah, they're Australian birds. So my mother-in-law has them in and around her property. She oh, lives cool. up in the mountains, so they're found in parts of Victoria. The satin bowerbirds, which is kind of, I guess, what we've, I would say, with the sour satin bowerbirds, kind of what we've taken on as our little mascot. But yeah. they have different kinds that are up in far north Queensland as well. But do yeah. they do their their presentation differently, or they do? Yeah, really? yeah. Different. Some of them, some bowers, like we said, are like the long, sprawling ones with the little tent poles, and then some of them are just kind of like little curvatures. Right. They're totally funny. Yeah, yeah that's the hilarious. one I envision is more the curvature. The curvature. But I remember yeah. seeing that there's some that make. Yeah, there's some. Yeah, like, like beautiful. And they do this just to attract a mate, right? They, it's it's true. like check out my place. They check do. out my place. Right. But the cool thing was is like they have a favorite color, so they're yeah. like it, their favorite it like color turquoise is it's or blue. Something? blue. It's blue because it's hard to find in nature. And, but and they, they know, that. Like, they know, know that. it. There's that <laughs> intuition there. And they spend crazy amounts of time making collections, whether it be of little shells or little beetles or, you know, flower blossoms or whatever happens to catch that particular bird's eye. They will spend hours and well, days creating like mosaics almost in front of their bower and organizing yeah. their collections and just. It's, they're very fastidious. Just hoping to, to impress a lady that will like, I've yeah. really laid this place out nice. I got some blue. Yeah. Couldn't you see yourself here? <laughs> <laughs> Come like, join yeah, me. Man. And I love like in the videos of it, the, the, 
the female bird will come along and kind of like check it out. And she'll be like, she's like, what is this? Not sure. Uh, and like, see you yeah. later. And, and then <laughs> the poor but bird's like, left what? there like, I just spent three years on this. She's like, yeah, I have yeah. to move it. I need more beetles. <laughs> I should have moved that over there. Exactly. Yes, that's what they do. Yeah, I needed more beetles. <laughs> so yeah. we just thought it was, it was different. Um, it, it was different and we just connected to more or less their work ethic and um, just their how eye they and yeah, yeah, yeah how they work. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's and we cool. figured that we wouldn't be battling anybody in Maine with the same name. Right. No. So right. we thought, hey, you know what? And I mean, I imagine it's a bit of a conversation starter as well. It has so. been. Definitely. Yeah. It has been. Definitely. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of similar to a bird of paradise, but instead of like if you were a fashion designer, maybe you would go to right. birds of paradise fashion right. designer. <laughs> yeah. But instead, there's these, there are these little guys that like actually create spaces, which is super cool. So fun. So, well, thank you so much for uh, coming across the river. <laughs> to uh, I'm usually Traveling saying coming far. all the way down to Bitterford. Right. From, but yeah, well, it was really fun talking to you. Thank and, you. You uh, as well. Thank you for choosing to put your business in uh, a little bit more southern Maine down here, Saco and Bitterford. Obviously, I think it's a great idea. I'm glad that you do too. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, and I'll have to come over and check out your guys' space sometime. I haven't. Oh, I've like... only actually been in the front door of the mill over there for that one. I haven't, haven't seen yeah. any other yeah. part of it. So. We'll give I'll you the to tour. Cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks.